Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. I pray that our hearts would indeed be prepared for your word. We ask that your word would have a place in our hearts. We pray that you would do work in us, that you would remove our white knuckle grip on the things of this earth, that you would loosen our attachments to things that are perishing, that you would weaken our fidelity to things that are displeasing to you. And we pray as we look this morning at the culmination of all things, that this would affect us, that we would indeed be changed, that every waking hour and every walking moment of our days from this day forward would be marked by the truths we will see today. We ask for power. We ask for clarity. We ask for transformation. By the hands of your Holy Spirit, wielding his sword, your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 10. Uh, we will continue this morning our study verse by verse of this book, dealing with the ends of days. Revelation chapter 10. If you're a passenger in a moving vehicle, I would suggest that you anticipate the turn. The moving vehicle is coming to some sharp corner. It's helpful for you to have your eyes up and to see what's coming. Of course, it is more important if you're the driver to do that. But thinking as a passenger, when you're not at the wheel, you're not at the helm, you're not in control, what does it mean to anticipate the turn? It means to have your eyes up on the horizon and see where the road's going and allow your inner ear and your guts to go with the turn. If you're on a roller coaster and reading a book, it probably will not go well for you physiologically. If you are in the back seat of the minivan and your big sister is learning to drive, I would suggest look out the windows. Be prepared. If you're on the back seat of a motorcycle, if you are not anticipating the turn, you can actually upset the balance of the vehicle and ruin everyone's day. Anticipating the turn is important. In fact, the more violent the turn, the more drastic the consequences for unpreparedness. In our home right now, we are anticipating a wedding. That is a bit of a turn of events. It will be a change for our family and our home. And so everything is geared right now towards the preparations and the supplies and, and all the things that head towards such a momentous event. It, it will be life-changing. Some of these momentous events and life-changing things, you can think about the before and after. Maybe you can think about your own life and remember, oh, I remember before I was married. I remember the life after I got married. You can think about your own salvation. I remember what my life was like before I knew Christ, and now I think about the after. There are momentous events and turning points in life which sort of mark out histories. They're dramatic. Something of a precipice or a, a turning point from which there is no going back. There is good news in the passage we will look at this morning. In fact, I want to put your eyes on Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. At the end of that verse, there is good news proclaimed. The good news here is the, the familiar word gospel or good news. And, and to proclaim the good news is the word to evangelize. That's where we get our English word. This good news in Revelation 10.7 is not the good news of substitutionary atonement. It is the good news or the gospel of consummation of the apex of history, the change of everything, the turning point of human history, the recovery of the world, the restoration of the earth. It is the good news of the culmination of God's redemptive plan for the world. 
What we're looking at in this text is the gospel of the kingdom. You see, God has good news for the world to save sinners and to restore the creation to the condition he intended for it. It is God bringing to earth his kingdom, that kingdom which will be mediated through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in a reign on the earth that will last a thousand years that will then continue forever and ever into a new heavens and new earth. It's truly a turning point in history. Let's read together Revelation chapter 10 and the first seven verses. Then I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little scroll which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the earth. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the earth, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he proclaimed good news to his slaves, the prophets." What we read about in this text is the anticipation of the great turning point in world history. This passage is outlined by three signals that anticipate that turning point. This section of scripture is an interlude from the chronology of Revelation as we've been going through this book. It's, it's a pause in the step-by-step -step series of events that outline God's judgment against the world in the end times. In fact, chapter 10, verse 1, all the way down through chapter 11, verse 14, is this pause or interlude or intermission between the sixth judgment of trumpets and the seventh trumpet judgment. Just as there was a pause between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, just as there will be a pause between the sixth bowl and the seventh bowl, there is a pause here between the sixth and seventh trumpet judgments. And this pause serves several purposes. It will set the stage for the next judgment for us in chapter 11. But here, I think the force of chapter 10 is to give encouragement to believers then in the midst of all the awful undoing of the earth during this judgment period, we see that God is sovereign and he is pushing history towards his intended end. And the history and the turning point that God is driving the world towards is good news. It's good, no, good news for those who are his. And so this serves as something of an encouragement in this intermission for God's people. He is sovereign and he is faithful. Good news is coming. The first mark, the first signal that is anticipated here from heaven is a heavenly messenger. Look down at verse 1. John records, Then I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, the rainbow upon his head, his face like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire, and in his right hand he held a little scroll open, his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the earth. This is another strong angel. We saw a strong angel depicted in chapter 5, verse 2, the one in heaven who said, Who is worthy to open the seals, to break them, and to unroll the scroll? In other words, to bring about the end times judgments of God, to usher in future history. And we discovered only Jesus is worthy to do such a thing. Here we have another strong angel making another pronouncement. This is another angel of the same kind. And he is depicted here as coming down out of heaven. And that tells us that John in his prophetic role has now changed locations. He's no longer in the throne room observing what's going on in there. John's vantage point has shifted in chapter 10 to the earth. And he sees this strong angel coming down out of heaven. And the angel 
looks like he has been in heaven. It looks like he has been in the unvarnished presence of the glory of God. He is radiating the brilliance and the holiness and the justice and the beauty of the throne room. If you've been sunburned, you know the effect of the the face that glows for days after. It's not particularly comfortable. But your face radiates the fact that you've been in the presence of the sun. Maybe a better illustration of this was Moses when he came down off of the mountain and stood before the people. He had been in the very presence of God and his face radiated with the glory of God, sort of a, a reflector. And the people said, that's too bright, Moses. We don't want to look at you that way. Can you put something over your face? And this strong angel in this scene bears on his face the radiating afterglow of the presence of God. The text tells us he is clothed with a cloud. And the clouds in prophetic literature in your Bible are often emblems of the storms of coming judgment from heaven against the earth. He is said to have the rainbow upon his head. You remember in chapter 4, there was an emerald rainbow emanating from the throne of God. This was the reminder in heaven that God is a God of faithfulness and mercy. The rainbow in the Old Testament was designed to show the world that God will not again judge the world by a universal flood. He will not again bury the earth with water. And every time there's a rainbow, that is what we are to remember, that God is a God who judges and this judging God has mercy upon sinners. And this rainbow over the head of the angel has the angel descending out of heaven, filled with the passions of heaven, and even the mercy of God amidst the clouds of judgment is on display in this strong angel. His face is said to shine like the sun, a face so bright, radiating with the glory of the throne room that you couldn't look at it. And he is said to have feet like pillars of fire. Fire depicts the the altar and the sacrifice and the holy justice of God. And and the word for feet here includes the lower legs. His feet and lower legs are like pillars. That is, they are sturdy, immovable. It's clear that this strong angel has been in close proximity with the manifest presence of God. He has been in the throne room, intimately acquainted with the glory and faithfulness of God. God is faithful both to save and to judge. He keeps His promises. And while the earth dwellers lose sight of this regularly, heaven has never forgotten. This angel radiates with heaven's values. He is a visual representation of heaven's great concerns. Notice verse 2. He had in his hand a little scroll which was open. We're not told explicitly what this scroll is, but it seems to represent the realities of the termination of the way things have been, the reality of the bringing in of this new order. One has described this as the decree of the counsels of God about to take place. And notice that this little scroll is open. That is, its contents are not sealed up. It's it's not a secret. This is likely a physical summary of this coming turning point of history, the consummation, the arrival of the kingdom of heaven to the earth. Look down at verse 10. We read there that John took the little scroll out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in his mouth it was sweet as honey. And when he had eaten it, his stomach was made bitter. Lord willing, we'll study this section in a couple of weeks John is instructed to eat the little scroll. This happened a couple of times to Old Testament prophets as well. The littleness of this scroll seems to have the purpose that John could ingest it. And it will be sweet to the taste, but turn his stomach. And you have to understand the, the, the import of that is that there is a good news and bad news in the good news. It is good news, of course, that the world will no longer groan under the burden of rebellion. We will no longer say, how long, O Lord, till your glory is no longer trampled, till your people are run down? When will you act? Thy kingdom come. That longing will be done. Those prayers will have been answered. But in that good news is the bitterness of people's who have not turned from their rebellion, who for in order for God to make his new order in the world, 
will judge that rebellion. Salvation available to all who will believe, but the, the bitter aftertaste is the reality that many do not. This strong angel has a right foot on the sea and a left foot on the earth. In Deuteronomy 11.24, Moses, instructing the people of Israel, said, Wherever the soles of your feet touch, you shall possess. Perhaps this is a, a reference to the idea of ownership of heaven, of all that goes on the earth. The import of this strong angel, perhaps he is gargantuan in size and wide-stanced, with one foot on the sea and the other on the land, is that his announcement will encompass the whole world. Land and sea, everything in between. God's coming intervention in the affairs of the earth will not be regional, it will not be isolated, it will not be individualized in the hearts of men, it will be real, it will be geopolitical. It will fill the earth. There is a second signal in this scene anticipating this turning point of history. And it is an ominous outburst. An ominous outburst. Look at verse 3. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. This outburst begins with the angel himself crying out. He is said to cry out with a great voice. Some voices carry more than others. Maybe you know somebody with a booming voice that, that when they speak out loud, the room goes quiet and everybody pays attention. This angel is said to cry out loudly with a voice as a lion. I don't know if you've ever been to Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. It's a great zoo. It's free. You just walk in. What's startling about Lincoln Park Zoo is the lions. They are so close to the fence. And if you're not careful and you're not paying attention, you will round the corner when a lion roars. And it is terrifying. Some of you have lived in places where you can hear lions roar. It's hard to imagine a more terrifying sound. It is loud and it rattles your cage. This angel has such a voice. There's another part of this outburst and it is seven thunders speaking. Seven thunders speaking. Seven peals of thunder is literally just seven thunders. And, and they're talking. What does it sound like when thunder talks? These are clearly articulate thunders. These voices have words. They are intelligible words. How do we know that? Because John is about to write them down. We don't know what they said. Those who were on the earth in those days, will they hear those thunders and will they understand the utterance? While it may be unknown to us, when the time comes for the contents to be known, they will be known. And then we get this voice from heaven. The voice from heaven prohibited John from writing down what the seven thunders spoke. And this goes against what John had been commanded prior in the book of Revelation, twice in chapter 1, once in chapter 14, once in chapter 19, and once in chapter 21, John is commanded, write. And when you come to those sections, you get the impression that John, the revelator, seeing these heavenly visions, he, he's supposed to write, and, and maybe he is so awestruck by what he sees, the, the pen has fallen out of his hands and his jaw is on the floor, and, and he has to be commanded again, John, write. Write this down. That is the norm in this book. But here, John is prohibited from writing what the seven thunders spoke. Uh, this happened with Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 8, verse 26. As for the details related to the evenings and mornings which Daniel saw, he was told, seal it up, for it pertains to the future. That has some interesting implications as we think about this book whether Daniel or Revelation. When you have a moment where the prophet witnessed something and is told not to write it, but conceal it. And then at other por portions, he's told to write it. 
What is the implication for us? The, the book of Revelation is not a closed, sealed book of mysteries to be unknown, to be ignored, uh, to, to just surrender to, I don't understand what's going on there, so I'm not going to read it. No, quite the contrary. Blessed is the one who reads and heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. In fact, the very word revelation means a revealing, not a concealing. And when you have a statement like this where there was something that John saw that he's not to write down, the implication is, as Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, there are secret things that belong to the Lord, but there are things revealed. And why are they revealed? For us and for our children, Moses said, so that we may do them so that we may obey the words of the Lord. So just as a reminder of what the book of Revelation is, it is God's intentional disclosure of himself, his character, his nature, and his purposes, so that we as the readers of God's word might know our God. Not only who he is, what he is like, but what he will do with the world in which we live. And this is one of the most profound effects of reading and studying the book of Revelation on our hearts. We need this. We need over and over again to be disattached from our idolatries, disattached from our holding on to temporal things. We need to be healed of our temporal mindedness. We need to stop thinking about the people around us merely from a horizontal and temporary point of view, but rather to view every single human being we see as an eternal being, someone who will live forever, whether under the judgment of God or in the joy of God. There's another signal here that anticipates this turning point of history. And it is the solemn oath that we see in verses 5 through 7. Look at verse 5. Then the angel, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the earth, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore. Here this angel is not saying bad words. He is swearing in the sense of giving a solemn oath. And notice his posture. He's standing on the sea and on the land. That is, he's declaring over the whole earth what is about to happen. And he lifts up his right hand to heaven. And we do this when we solemnly swear. And notice his address. Verse 6. He swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it. The angel makes this solemn vow, this solemn declaration, this solemn oath by the very person of God. I swear by God, he says. And he describes two of God's essential attributes. First of all, his eternality. Look what he says. He swore by him who lives forever and ever. This means God is essentially eternal. I just mentioned that every human being who lives will live forever, but our eternality is a gift. God gives us life. God has eternal life in himself. It is intrinsic to his nature to exist. He is self-existent. He is uncreated. He has always been and he will always be just by the very nature of his being God. He has life in himself, and he gives life to whom he chooses. He is called throughout the Bible, the living God. That's a contrast to the dead idols, the false gods, and the deities of the world's religions. It's also a contrast to every created thing. Every created thing has an existence which is derived, it is derivative, it's dependent, Only God is independent. Only God simply is. This is bound up in in his personal name, which he gave for his people to know. Yahweh, built on the Hebrew verb to be. God simply is. Everyone else and everything else is dependent upon him for existence. 
When you think about God's eternality and self-existence, for this strong angel to swear by him who lives forever and ever is a stark reminder to every living creature, every sentient being, every human in rebellion on his earth. You owe God everything. You owe him your existence. You better get right with him. And then he points to a second attribute, God's creatorship. Look at verse 6. He swore by him who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it. The entire cosmos, the universe, the heavens and the earth, everything in between the throne room of God and this planet is made by God. This is one of God's fundamental attributes, his creatorship. The fact that he made everything, that he sustains everything. Uh, This is not a sidebar theology of the Bible. This is central to the Bible's message. This is, in fact, where the Bible begins. Do you remember the first verse? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is, he created the universe, everything. One of the greatest rebellions of humanity has been to deny the creatorship of God. Listen, the human heart knows that if there is no personal creator, then there is no personal accountability for how a life is lived. So evolution is, is not a, a scientific discovery. A scientific discovery means people actually being there, seeing it. A scientific discovery, if you follow the scientific method, requires reproducibility in the laboratory. Uh, Testing for falsifiability. None of that happens with the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution is one of many concoctions that is designed to remove from the human psyche the reality of the creatorship of God. That God spoke everything to existence out of nothing, that he holds everyone accountable. What do we find out in Romans chapter 1? That men know that God created everything, but they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. This is the real tragedy of our scientific mindset today. The prevailing consensus is that there is no God or that the, the God who may be is unknowable and really unimportant. Everything must boil down to some natural explanation, and yet nature itself has always been dependent on God speaking it into existence. And you cannot alter God's creatorship without mangling the Bible itself, because God predicates his own identity, his existence, his power, his attributes, and his purpose on his creatorship. He made everything out of nothing simply by speaking it into existence. I want to remind us for a few moments how these things are related in the Bible. Of course, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When you get to Exodus chapter 20 and the laying out of God's prescriptions for how to live, he gave Israel the Ten Commandments. And in those Ten Commandments, he gave them a special day to set aside, a, a Saturday, the seventh day. And the explanation for it is this, for in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth. Therefore, you work on six days. He's speaking there of six literal normal days, not some poetic description of eons or something else. Deuteronomy 10.14 says, Behold, to Yahweh your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. And the implication in Deuteronomy 10 is, how much more should your own heart, your own mind, your own scientific endeavors, your own loyalties, your own living belong to the one who owns the universe. It's all his. God predicates his uniqueness on his creatorship. Listen to 1 Chronicles 16, 26. All the gods, small g, of the peoples are idols, but Yahweh made the heavens. See, his own identity is predicated on creating. Psalm 33, 6 to 9. By the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made. 
Therefore, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. It is the creature's obligation to worship the creator. Listen, rebellious man just doesn't want to do that. Psalm 115, 15, it's the basis of our worship of him. May you be blessed of Yahweh, who is maker of heaven and earth. It is the basis of our help, Psalm 124, 8. Our help is in the name of Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. It is the basis of our understanding of God's design and engineering and skill, Psalm 136, 5. To the one who made the heavens with skill, his loving kindness is everlasting. It is a ground of accountability. Listen to Proverbs 14, 31. The one who oppresses the poor taunts his maker, but he who is gracious to the needy honors him. Listen, how you live your life is based on the fact that you're made by God. God's creatorship is related to his rulership over the nations, Isaiah 37, 16. O Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, you are enthroned above the cherubim. You are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Whatever the geopolitics looks like in a given age, whatever party is in power, whatever tyrant is in charge, what is the truth behind the scenes? God's the king over all. And what is the basis for that understanding? He made heaven and earth. He built the universe. He owns it all by right of creation. Listen to Isaiah 66 too. Yahweh says, My hand made all these things. Thus, all these things came into being, declares Yahweh. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. Listen, the God who is transcendent, who is bigger and beyond the universe, looks down at the individual level in love to people who will look to him in faith. It's truly remarkable. We can look up at the stars in the night sky and understand our smallness, I've said before that we're terrible astronomers. We tend to let our minds go and think that we're the center of the universe. And it takes one look on a starry night with no light from the cities to recognize I'm actually really small. And the God who's bigger than all of that looks down at the individual level to his creatures and with love and affection cares for all who will look to him in faith. And then, of course, the creatorship of God is related to the gospel. Listen to this testimony of Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who shines in our hearts to, li- to give the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Christ. And he hearkens back to Genesis 1, and he says, Do you remember the God who said, light be And something that did not exist obeyed the voice of God by coming into existence and shining for the first time. The God with that power is the one who shines in our hearts the gospel of his son so that we might know him and love him, be loved by him. We might summarize the relationship of God's creatorship to the gospel this way. He is a creator with redemptive purpose. And he's a redeemer with creative power. He made everything. He made the earth to be inhabited. He made people in the earth so that they might know him and have fellowship with him and have delight in him. And he saves with the kind of power that it takes to call non-existent things into existence by his very word. He's a creator with redemptive purpose and a redeemer with creative power. So much is riding on God's identity, his power and his purpose as creator. It's no wonder that the world and its rebellion seeks to suppress the creatorship of God. And listen, when evolution goes the way of the dodo bird, and some other theory replaces it, some other man-centered theory, some other uh, scientific consensus. 
It will be another version of suppression of the truth. That the God who made everything out of nothing holds every single individual accountable and will one day bring his kingdom to this earth. This is the basis of this solemn address by this strong angel from heaven. Finally, notice his pronouncement. Look at the end of verse 6. He says, There will be delay no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he proclaimed good news to his slaves, the prophets. This angel begins with the words, Time's up. Time's up. There has been delay, but there will be delay no longer. From our vantage point, this is still looking to the future. John is seeing a vision of this, but this is still yet to come. Why has there been delay? Why has God not ended the rebellion of his creatures long ago? Why doesn't God just put an end to it? I mean, people complain all the time. If God is real, and if he's powerful, and he's good, why is there all this evil in the world? You know the answer to that question. We are all evil by nature, and if God were to exterminate all evil, he would eradicate us all, and there would be no hope. God is, in fact, patient. His delay has been for the purpose that Paul describes in 2 Timothy 2.4. God desires all men to be saved. People from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, people of all sorts, kings, all who are in authority, the lowly, the great and the small, people from every walk of life. God has been very patient for thousands of years with his rebellious creature. That patience goes misinterpreted, however, Peter describes this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, In the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. They will say, Where's the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, everything continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. But the time is coming when the delay will be no more. God is the owner of time, he's the owner of history, and he will bring history to its turning point. When will that be? We find out in verse 7. There will be delay no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he is about to sound. That tells us when this apex, this climax, this precipice of world history will come about. The sixth trumpet judgment wrapped up at the end of chapter 9. The seventh trumpet judgment comes in chapter 11. Look down at verse 15 of chapter 11. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. So the era that this angel is describing is the period of the seventh trumpet judgment. And notice in verse 7, it is described as the days of the sounding of the seventh angel. Uh, That is, not a moment, not not instantaneous, but a short period. uh, Weeks, perhaps. Maybe months. But what happens with the seventh trumpet, when the seventh angel sounds that trumpet, seven more judgments unfold. These are the seven bowl judgments, or vile judgments. This is a rapid fire unleashing of the final judgment from heaven against the earth dwellers. It's depicted in chapter 16. And they are one after the other. They happen in rapid succession. And they are followed by the battle of Har Magadon, the the Mount of Megiddo, or we call it the Battle of Armageddon. That will be the final stand of the rebellious world, allying all of its armies against Jesus when Jesus returns in Revelation 19 to make war with them. Spoiler alert, Jesus wins. This final series of judgments marks the turning point of history. When in the words of chapter 11, verse 15, the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. That tells us a couple of things. The the, the kingdom of Christ isn't now on this present earth in the way that it will be then. His kingdom actually will come to the earth. 
And notice what the angel says about this time. He says, then the mystery of God is finished. It's really a a stunning statement. The mystery of God is finished then. We don't usually talk about future circumstances with past tense verbs. This is one of those. There are a couple of starting, startling places where this happens in our Bibles. One that might come to your mind is that chain of events in Romans 8. For God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. For those whom He called, or excuse me, for those whom He uh, prede- for those whom He foreknew, excuse me, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, both past tense realities. And all whom he predestined, he also called. Past tense reality describing your salvation. All those whom he called, he also justified. That is the declaration of righteousness when you got saved. And all whom he justified, he also, what does it say? Glorified. There it is again, a future reality with a past tense verb. What is the significance of a statement like that? In the plan of God, it says good is done. This is a guarantee in Romans 8.28. It's the unbreakable chain of salvation from eternity past to eternity future. Here in Revelation chapter 10, it is the unstoppable force of the reality of God's coming kingdom. You remember the way this was portrayed in the book of Daniel, like a stone not cut with human hands, that comes down out of heaven and comes to the earth and smashes that great statue, which is the emblem of all human governance for all of human history. And the kingdom of Messiah will come and smash all of those to powder and replace them as the kingdom of the world. That's what's coming. Notice what the angel says about the time. He calls it the, the mystery of God. The mystery is finished. Uh, What is a mystery? The the Greek word for mystery is mystery. And it is something that was concealed but is now revealed. It's It's a common enough word in the Bible and is used throughout the New Testament. Jesus used the word mystery to describe the mysteries of the kingdom in Matthew 13. Paul described the mystery of lawlessness That is the the mystery of the Antichrist ethos in the world that will culminate in an Antichrist individual in the end times. Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15 the mystery of the rapture and resurrection event. In chapter 11 of Romans, Paul describes the mystery of the hard-heartedness of Israel's spiritual blindness. And then throughout the New Testament, Ephesians and Colossians and many other places, Paul uses the word mystery to describe the church. That is the the church that had its birthday in Acts 2 and then goes home at the rapture was not seen prior. It was a mystery that Jew and Gentile would be together in one body called the church. In fact, most of the times the word mystery is used in the New Testament. It's referring to that. The Old Testament prophets didn't see that one coming. It was concealed before and revealed now. There is also the mystery of the incarnation. Paul describes this in 1 Timothy 3. The mystery that God would take on flesh. He calls it the mystery of godliness. That God himself would inhabit a a human body and live and dwell amongst us. And here in chapter 10... We have the simple statement, this is the mystery of God which is finished. And this is sort of a a culmination of of all of redemptive history. It it includes salvation and judgment and Jew and Gentile relationships and the kingdom and the work of Christ and the renewal of creation, the fulfillment of promise, the reverse of the curse and the installment of the kingdom. This is the great turn in history. This is the great consummation, the summing up of all things in Christ. And when Jesus comes in Revelation 19 and eliminates his enemies and locks up Satan and his demons and judges unbelief, he will establish his throne in Jerusalem and reign on the earth for a thousand years. 
And that thousand year reign on the earth will move seamlessly into a new heavens and a new earth, a newly created universe in which there will be no more sin, no more curse, no more death, no more sorrow. The old things have gone. That will be the eternal state. What happens when the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of God and of his Christ? It will mean the judgment of Satan, the judgment of demons, and the judgment of all unbelief. It will also mean the salvation of the earth and the salvation of all who believe. And this is a mystery. This is a mystery to the world. The world right now does not acknowledge what the owner of the world is up to. He's been up to this from the beginning of time. But this great mystery, concealed to the world now, will be revealed to the world then. On the precipice of that great reversal, the great renewal. The man of lawlessness will be revealed. Satan will be openly worshipped. Anti-Semitism will be uh, universal. The armies of the world will ally themselves against Israel. And then the judgments of God, the, the very judgments of God from heaven coming down to the earth in disaster after disaster will be public. And so the mystery will be revealed. Notice the last part of verse 7. Just as God proclaimed good news to his slaves, the prophets. The prophets in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, were those who spoke by direct revelation. They said, thus saith the Lord. They conveyed what God spoke. Uh, many of those prophecies are written and are what we have in the Bible. Some of the prophets were merely speaking prophets and gave direct revelation in their time to God's people. The writing prophets are the ones that have those recorded for us in the Bible. But in all of those, who was speaking according to verse 7? No prophecy came about as the, the thoughts and imaginations of, of some guy. This was God speaking. He proclaimed good news. The word proclaim good news, it's three words in English, it's all one word in Greek, and it is the word evangelized. He evangelized. He evangelized to his slaves, the prophets. They were his spokesmen. This idea of proclaiming good news is familiar to us. We think about good news and the gospel. We think about evangelism and evangelizing, mostly in terms of, of talking about the death of Jesus in the place of sinners. We we think about the gospel as substitutionary atonement. But you know, the gospel, the word gospel, simply means good news. And, and the proclamation of the gospel is the heralding of good news. Here in this text, the good news is the culmination of redemptive history and the arrival of the kingdom. That's why we're not surprised in the gospel accounts, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the history of the earthly ministry of Jesus. We're not surprised when we read there that John the Baptist or the disciples or even Jesus himself went around preaching the good news of the kingdom. Preaching the good news of the kingdom. That does not mean the word kingdom equals substitutionary atonement. You don't substitute for the word kingdom something like the crosswork of Messiah. Those are two different words with two different meanings. And we might think, well, was Jesus not preaching about the cross? What, what was John the Baptist preaching? What were the disciples going about doing when they were preaching the kingdom? The reality is they were preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. It's so close. It's near. Therefore, repent. You better turn. Why? Because the king is here. What makes the kingdom the kingdom is the presence of the king. And so it's, it's true as part of the mystery, are believers part of the kingdom now, yet we're citizens of the kingdom now, and, and Christ reigns in our hearts. Yes, that's true, but, but there is a manifest geopolitical, physical kingdom coming to the earth where Jesus will actually reign. And when Jesus came the first time, everywhere he went, diseases were healed. The blind saw, the lame leaped, demons were cast out. All of that is a foretaste of kingdom come, a reversal of the curse. 
Jesus as Lord, people acknowledging who he is. Even the demons were compelled to say, I know who you are. Listen, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, I know who you are. So when Jesus came the first time, that good news was preached. And then what did they do with the king when he was here? They trumped up phony charges. They couldn't pin anything on him. They made up stuff. And they crucified him. And the gospel of substitutionary atonement, the death of Jesus in the place of sinners, is what qualifies believers for the good news of the coming kingdom. The world's been waiting for this for a long time. Believers, particularly, have been waiting for this reversal for a long time. Genesis 3.15 is this sort of first promise after the fall of man into sin. And God promised Eve that she would bear a son, that she would bear a seed that would crush the head of the snake. Sort of undo the damage. What did Eve think? According to Genesis 4.1, she thought it was Cain, her firstborn. Must be him. Behold, I have begotten a man-child, Yahweh. It wasn't Cain. Cain was a murderer and unqualified. Abel, of course, was unqualified because he was dead. And every successive generation brought disappointment after disappointment of who's going to fulfill the seed promise. When you get to Simeon and he's holding this infant Jesus And he knows this is the one. His heart is filled with all the anticipation of the restoration of Israel. He's not wrong. But he didn't see a gap between a first coming and a second coming. I think John the Baptist similarly. He he knows this is the one. He he sees Jesus proclaiming the good news. He, He sees all the realities that Jesus is doing. He's been brought forth, John the Baptist has been brought forth as a herald to straighten the highway for the coming king. And John the Baptist died in prison, not seeing the fulfillment. Look at Luke chapter 4. Jesus shows up in a synagogue. as a rabbi, a teacher. And by appearances, he looks like an unconventional teacher, but kind of like all the other teachers around. Verse 16 says, As was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, the eyes of everybody fixed upon him. And he was saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, that's audacious for any rabbi to say. But this is God in the flesh, and he's right. He wrote that, and now he's fulfilling it. He's here. What's stunning is he quotes Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, but he stops in the middle of verse 2. Because Isaiah 61, 2 says, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord... And then moves on to the judgment that we see in the book of Revelation in the second coming. He stopped in the middle of a verse, closed the scroll, handed it back to the attendant and sat down and said, this has been fulfilled. What's been fulfilled? First coming realities? Oh, there's this gap. Okay, we're, we're waiting. We, since Eve, we waited 4,000 years for this one to arrive. Simeon had been waiting all of his life and then he finally held the baby. This is going to be it. And Jesus says, nope, there's a gap. In John 12, you have a a similar gap. There you have the triumphal entry down to the very day that Daniel prophesied. Jesus walks into Jerusalem riding 
a donkey. The crowds come out. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh, even the king of Israel. Verse 14, Jesus finding a young donkey sat on it. As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And there, Jesus quotes Zechariah 10, verse 9, but stops before verse 10. Verse 9 is the part about the king coming in on a colt. Verse 10 is about the judgment. And all the stuff we read in the book of Revelation. And there's a split between the two. So far of a couple thousand years. Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection, the disciples similarly, they'd seen Jesus teach, they'd seen him work miracles, they'd seen him raise the dead, they knew he was the one, and then they saw him crucified after he rose from the dead. Verse 3, he presented himself Alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, he appeared to them over 40 days and he spoke about the things concerning the kingdom of God. Verse 6, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has set by his own authority. But for now, you'll get power from the Holy Spirit. You'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. The king came, now the king's leaving, and he's sending out his people as ambassadors of his kingdom to represent him while he's gone, and we wait. And we wait for his return. Listen, the, the good news of Jesus' death in the place of sinners, we look back on. The good news of his return and the establishment of his kingdom and setting everything right, we look forward to. There's good news that has been fulfilled. There is good news yet to come. That good news yet to come is what's on display in this Revelation chapter 10. Think about church history. Most of the generations of church history have from time to time put their eyes up and said, I, I think it's now. This world's really bad. <laughs> Could it get any worse? Jesus has to come back in our lifetime. And he hasn't come back in their lifetimes. Generations have come and gone. Perhaps ours will come and go. Some generation, someday, is going to be right. I pray it's ours. What is our duty? Philippians 3.21, long for his appearing. 1 Timothy 4, love his appearing. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, eagerly await his appearing. This is what it means to believe, to turn to God from idols, to the living God from false things, and to await his son who comes from heaven. Listen, when the turn happens, when the day of man is over and the day of the Lord begins, when God sets up his king over the earth, and those who love him and believe him reign with him on the earth. Then what the prophet said in Isaiah 11, 9 will be true. The earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray. Oh Lord, your words are wonderful. There is a sweetness to them we cannot describe. And we also feel the turning of the stomach as we think about what it means that you will return and hold to account a rebellious world. We, we have friends who are yet rebels. We have children who are yet in rebellion against you. There are people in this church who pretend Christianity and are not yet born again. We have coworkers and neighbors who need to know you. And God, you are delaying. Thank you for your grace in the delay. Will you be pleased to use us in this generation to make known the riches of your grace in Christ? And would you be pleased to draw these ones whom we love and we know to yourself through the gospel of your son? We ask it in his name. Amen.